Good evening and welcome. My name is Tanisha Shade Spain and I'm your host for Mid American Gardener. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've got a super duper great show lined up for you this evening. We are live. We're on a brand new set. We've got great guests. We've got great show and tells. Just so much to get to tonight. So we would love to have your phone calls also a little bit later into the show. So as I mentioned, we've got a lot to get to. So let's have our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty and uh, we'll go from there. So Jen, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson. Um, I'm a horticulturalist and I write a blog called Grounded and Growing. Uh, my favorite questions are general horticulture and houseplants and vegetables. All right, Phil. Hi, I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. And that means I cover insect questions. And so if you got something bugging you, I can help out. <laughs> nice. Okay. I'm Kay Carnes. I'm the Champaign County Master Gardener. And I like to answer questions about herbs and vegetables, uh, especially heirlooms and um, perennials, some perennials and annuals and Wonderful. all kinds of things. <laughs> all right, so we've got a great uh, panel group tonight here to answer all the questions that you've got and also take a look at this beautiful new set. I think this is the first time you're seeing it, first time I'm seeing it. So uh, shout out to the crew. They did a fantastic job, DJ and the gang, putting this together. Um, it looks really, really beautiful. So. Uh, thanks to them for that. Okay, so show and tells. Jen, we'll start with you. Uh, everybody brought in a few things, so uh, what's your first thing? Oh, uh, our first thing, this <laughs> unhappy looking specimen. I swear <laughs> I cut it and I put it in water and it just does not like it. Uh, this, probably a lot of our viewers will find this in their backyard. This happens to be an ornamental pear gone wild. One of the problems with ornamental pear, like the Cleveland or the Bradford pear, we all like their flowers in the spring, but they have started to outcross with each other and produce these wild type seedlings that have nasty, nasty thorns. I don't know if they can get that out. Oh the, yeah, we can see them. Yeah, <laughs> it's horrible. And um, they're everywhere. So the very first thing in the spring that we see blooming that's um, white flowers, you see it a lot in the um, uh, clover leaves on the highway. It is ornamental pear. It's becoming a problem in our woodlands. And so they need to really not be planted in landscapes anymore. And I actually found this in, growing in my yard under a viburnum bush. Wow. And I somehow missed it. It's gotten quite big and nasty. So does, so someone in your neighborhood maybe have oh, some? Yeah. Or how do you, oh, okay. Oh yeah, we, we have several neighbors with them. We used to have quite a few of them planted um, down a boulevard in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, they also tend to be really susceptible to fire blight. That's what took out the ones in our neighborhood all 19 of them at one time, <laughs> which was okay with me. And then this guy pops up. Well, they're, they're actually all over my yard, and a friend pointed it out that we had quite a few little seedlings. I'd never noticed them. They were oh, just wow. small at the time, but this guy got somehow got really big. <laughs> nice. And so if you come across these and you don't want them, what's some advice for, uh, for folks? Remove them. Um, pull them out if you find them small. Um, bigger, you might have to use some mm -hmm. non-selective herbicides, maybe paint it on, cut it back and paint it on the stump. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Jen. And if they're really tiny, mowers work great on them. Yes. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good opportunity. No fuss, too. no yeah. mess. Right, that's Phil? Right. Mm. <laughs> one, one cut. <laughs> one cut, you're done. That's it. That's it. And okay. next week, it gets knocked back in, eventually gives it up. Okay. We'll come back to you, Jen, because I know you've got sure. another show and sell. Okay. So, Phil, we're moving to you. And you have an email question about Japanese beetles. Yes. Would you like me to read it or would you like to read it? I'll read it. Okay, go Give for it. Give you a break. Thanks. So thoughtful. Terry says, uh, is dusting with diatomaceous earth a useful tool to be added to the control of Japanese beetles? And is it safe for bees? He, Terry is from Quincy. And uh, if you're not familiar with Japanese beetles, uh, you kind of... Uh, you know, living in a cave or something like that. Uh, the damage is such that they will come on to the leaves and, uh, and will uh, uh, we'll feed at the top of the tree first. This is one of the few insects that likes to feed on the upper side of a leaf and will about holes in the leaves and, and go part way through and it get light colored and then you turn brown and so on. And they hit anything in the rose family. So, uh, and also like lindens, which is what you're looking at right here, but they like, uh, the rose family has our fruit trees, apples, peaches, pears, plums, pyracantha, cotone aster, roses, all these sorts of okay, things. Okay, now you're just showing off. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I've said that a few times in my life. Uh, and, uh, and the beetles themselves are, uh, are small. They are, uh, they are a, uh, an eighth of an inch to a, to, uh, 
we get him up here where you can actually see him. Now he's doing the uh, cockroach uh, <laughs> try. There we go. At any rate, they are uh, about three eighths to a half an inch long, and they are uh, they're going to be uh, um, they're go they're, go they're going to have uh, they're metallic green in color, and they have uh, coppery wing covers on their back. Uh, they're really pretty beetles, but uh, anything can be too much. The uh, <laughs> question is, is will the diatomaceous earth work? Well, yes and no. If you sit there and dust them with it, yes it will. But if you apply it to, to the plants, uh, you, it's probably not going to be enough. Uh, the diatomaceous earth is, is mined. It's, it's uh, essentially uh, made up of single-celled uh, silicaceous animals uh, and, and plants are sp and uh, essentially they've got silica in them which is means they're kind of like glass and they will scrape away the waxy covering on the outside of the insect causing it to dry out but where that works best is when they walk through it and get it into their joints and that all works and makes holes and all that sort of stuff and they bleed to death uh, eventually or dry out due to and uh, due to the waxy areas being taken away mm -hmm. and that will that may work a little bit down in the turf where they will lay their eggs and you'll get white grubs uh, but probably not very well it also doesn't work well if it gets rained on and uh, until it dries out again it has to be dry and dusty in order for it to work uh, is it safe for bees? It kills every kind of insect. Every kind of insect. Bees, butterflies, mm. everything, okay? So it is no selectivity whatsoever, uh, as long as it's in a dry situation. So yeah, you don't put it out there, probably very good. Uh, a, uh, probably the most or best organic thing is you can hand pick them after three in the afternoon and they'll if you bother them, they'll drop down and, and go into a, a bucket or a jar with, uh, with soapy water in it. You can, uh, you can, uh, you can spray them with, uh, with any pyrethroid insecticide every two weeks. Uh, Carboreal sold to seven, works the same every two weeks. They're out from about the first, first part of July through the middle of August. So, uh, so they've, they're pretty well, I've run their carts for this summer. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, the diatomaceous earth is something that theoretically would work, but in reality and practicality, no. Yeah, okay. All right, okay, thank you very much, Phil. We'll come back to you. Kay, you've got uh, tomatoes for I this brought round. some couple of heirloom tomatoes. Um, this one is a very pale yellow, and it's actually called a white tomato. Um, and this one is called White Queen. Um, they're kind of mild tasting, mm -hmm. but they're they're quite good, and oftentimes uh, they'll get a little pink blush on the bottom when they're really ripe like this. Um, so we we kind of like those. This one though is the star of the show this year for me. It's a new one. It's a Russian tomato, and I'm going to try to pronounce this. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Malaka Tubea Shak Tuluka. <laughs> That's a mouthful. And um, I'm going to cut it open because the inside is what you really want to see. It's green and it's red and it is very sweet. It's okay. just, and um, the packet said they were medium sized <laughs> tomatoes, but this one's actually a small one. I picked one that was a pound and 12 ounces. Wow. Um, so I would kind of call them large. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> but it really is a delicious tomato. And, and I've grown other green tomatoes and sometimes, um, they're they're kind of a little bit tart. Mm -hmm. They're not as sweet as some mm -hmm. of the others, but this one is extremely sweet. And you said you've been doing a lot of canning. I have lately. Yes. What other varieties? What's your, what's your favorite one that you've grown this year, other than this one? Um. Well, I've got a. It's a long red um, paste tomato mm -hmm. called uh, Blue Beach. Okay. <clears throat> and that's that's a very good tomato. Um, one of my favorite tomatoes I grew last year and brought them to the show. It's a little um, oblong, um, like a cherry tomato, mm -hmm. and it's was called... it a dark one? Was that dark in color? Um, I it was remember. green okay, and black. It, it's called Brad's Atomic Grape. Okay, 
and they are just outstanding. I think we should plan for a toma all tomato show. Or something. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> we could go all day with We've that We've got one. enough tomato growers on the yeah. panel. I think we could have fun. And I always grow about 10 different varieties, so awesome. I it's got a lot. Okay, of thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, we do have some calls on the line. Just to let you know the number, uh, if you were interested in calling, it's 333-3495. We are taking calls. And we're going to go to line one. We've got Cindy in Urbana with a question about a rose bush. Cindy, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, right, go ahead. Um, I have a rose bush in my uh, yard that um, my daughter bought for me probably 25 or more years ago at Kmart. So, you know, it's probably not a great um, bush. Anyway, it uh, so I moved it into a sunnier spot. It um, bloomed pretty well, then not so well. Then my neighbor, who knows a lot about plants, last March cut it way, way back. Now this summer we have, have lots of uh, foliage and no bloom. So that's my question. What should I do about it? Foliage and no blooms after a big cutback. Correct. Right. What are your thoughts? Is it possible that the top died? A lot of times the you have a grafted rose bush, and with the hard winter, you may have had some dieback of the of the part that you really want, and what you're seeing is rootstock. So with that, how would that present? How would she know? Generally, where the graft is, there's kind of an enlarged area that kind of looks like a knot. Okay. And so if it's coming from below that, that would be from the rootstock. Mm -hmm. How, how close to the ground did you cut it back? Um, well, she cut it back way closer than I would have, but um, not all the way down, maybe six inches. Okay, because usually a graft is two or three inches above the soil line. Yeah. Um, I can still look, though. I, I'll look for that. Yeah, even if he didn't cut all the way down before the graft, I think, uh, I think Jennifer's right on it because uh, it would have it would have been... Uh, you may have got it down below where it could sprout out, or it may be also that with the, as she mentioned, this, with a very cold weather, it may have killed off everything but the rootstock. Either way, would mm -hmm. end up with what you've got, probably. Is there any saving this, or should she rip it out and grab a new one? What are your thoughts? You could always give it another year. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Yeah, a gardener always gives it another right. year. Give it another chance. <laughs> Move it somewhere else right, in the yard Cindy. if you can't stand looking at it. And... <laughs> Give it one more year. Yeah. All right, we're going to go with that. <laughs> Tell it that. Wayne in a loud in voice. In Murrayville with a question about grapes and asparagus. Wayne, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead with your question. I, I've got some uh, Concord grapes that I planted five years ago, and every year uh, they come and they... They start getting green, and then they start getting little bitty spots on them, and then they start to ripen, and they just fall off. Are the uh, are the leaves have some curl on the edges as well, or do they have a tendency to be very small leaves? Uh, no, pretty big leaves, but they start getting brown around the edges. Uh, do any of the any of the grapes uh, ripen at all? Yeah, they, they ripen, but then uh, I go out there one day, they ripen, and then they fall off. Okay. If you've been, ex uh, it's probably maybe herbicide damage, uh, 2,4-D damage, which is a commonly used uh, uh, herbicide associated with, with lawn care, uh, will, uh, will cause uh, the grapes in a bunch to ripen unevenly. You'll get, uh, you'll get the first ones to ripen and then, and then, and then the rest will be green and then some more will ripen and the others will fall, well, the others will fall out. It seems like yours are falling off a little bit earlier than I would expect associated with 2,4-D, but that can, can be a situation. Some of the work done at the University of Illinois has indicated that if you have, if you have the right weather conditions and the invite, right inversion and things of this nature, you can have 2,4-D be sprayed within 10 miles of you and have this happen to grapes. So uh, don't look at your neighbor. Your neighbor may be way <laughs> down the road or in the next town. I, so uh, I've got, uh, I'm surrounded by farmers. Well, the, uh, the farmers now with the, uh, with the Roundup Ready and, and other sorts of things are not using the 2,4-D near much like they used to. So uh, it could be from that, but uh, it's more likely could be from anything else, could be the highway department, could be lots of different people 
uh, that would uh, might be using using that, uh, and it may be something totally different. But it sounds suspiciously like it could be that. Okay, and you had another question about asparagus. Yeah, asparagus. Okay. Uh, can you use that? Uh, it's, it's called perine, perine or something. Perine. It's supposed to keep weeds down. Is that safe for asparagus? They used, my old people told me to use rock salt, but they said that damages it. So I weed it by hand. Uh, rock salt ruins your soil yeah, where no nothing will grow. Yeah. That one's consistent <laughs> across the board. <laughs> don't use that. You know, I, don't know labeled, I don't know if preen is labeled for asparagus. Yeah. It really depends whether it's listed on the label of preen. Does anyone know offhand? I oh. think it is because I've heard it recommended by people I would trust those recommendations okay. on. Uh, but uh, but preen is a is a pre-emergent herbicide, and so mm -hmm. it's not going to it keeps things from coming up, right. and your asparagus will already be up by the time you apply it, so it wouldn't right. be an effect there. Yeah. Okay, all right, we're going to go back to a second round of show and tells, but I wanted to give you the number to call in three 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 four nine five if you'd like the experts to answer your question. Okay, so Jen, what's your second item? Um, I brought a house plant, one of my favorite house plants. This is called Hoya. H-O-Y-A, also called wax plant or porcelain plant. I've never heard that, that name before, but somebody had a question on it to me this week and called it that. Um, it's a really indestructible plant, hard to kill it. Um, this one I've had for several years and they do flower and I was really surprised this fine flowers on it a few weeks ago. And this is partly where it gets its name. The flowers look like they're sculpted out of wax or out of porcelain. Mm -hmm. And this one's kind of starting to fade, but uh, it smells exactly like chocolate, which mm -hmm. is really cool. Uh, one of the things about Hoya is they can take years to flower, and they have to get fairly long. Um, you start getting these really thin-looking sprouts that look like maybe they've not had enough light. That tends to mean that it's getting ready to flower. I okay. had one where I kept cutting these off. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be, trying to be really, you know, on top of my houseplant game, and then I realized I was removing all opportunities for flowers. But um, this is also a good example of this has not done really anything for me, um, and I've had it indoors for several years. And this is only the second summer I've put it outside, mm -hmm. and putting it outside seems to be just, you know, these are tropical plants. Mm -hmm. So hey, all the hot, humid weather, they mm -hmm. really like it. And sometimes you get some triggers for things like flowers uh, that you didn't expect to see. The other Hoya I have always flowers in February. I didn't expect to see one wow. flowering in the middle of summer, but there it is. Is okay. that supposed to be uh, uh, have two two colors on it, or is that sunburn in the center no, of sun this leaves? No, this is a variegated version. Okay, so a variegated. Yeah, no, this is supposed to be Because you like, get too much light <laughs> yeah, on some of them, it'll yeah. sunburn right in that same area. Yeah, so. there's another one I have that is um, the same species, but kind of the leaves are all contorted and it's called mm -hmm. Hindu rope. So okay. it actually grows yeah. in these long ropes. That's the one I've had that's flowered in the winter. But it pretty is pretty. Slow. Yeah, they're pretty slow growing mm -hmm. too. And pretty much any big garden center would have them. I love that you were pruning those off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody makes that's mistakes, right? right? Yeah. Even the experts. So actually, we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was actually writing an article about, uh, about Hoya and I read that as I was doing my research. I'm like, oh, dang it. <laughs> That's what that was. Oh. Well, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Okay, Phil, we're going to you. We've got another question. Uh, uh, Jen from Gibson City <clears throat> says, this is a nearby birch tree. She sent in some nice photos. I have included three pictures, and I wonder if it is something that will easily spread into my arborvitae. Please advise if there is preventative care I should take. I have used seven, and Jan is from Gibson City. So uh, what you've got is, uh, this was kind of in the show and tell area because I was going to bring a, uh, a piece of uh, a branch that had damage on it from my own yard, a fall webworm. And uh, just as I went to leave, it was beautifully raining buckets <laughs> of water. And uh, I knew that even if I got out there in the rain and, and clipped it, it would collapse when it would do to getting wet and soggy and so on. So that was a real good excuse for not getting <laughs> wet. Uh, but at any rate, this is fall webworm is what it is. And fall webworm has a very wide host range on deciduous trees, particularly forest type trees. It'll, uh, but it will not get on needled evergreens at all. So your arborvitae has no problem. There is a webworm that attacks arborvitae, but it's not near as impressive looking. And, uh, and it's in a whole different family of moths. So uh, these are caterpillars that are doing this, they'll grow into moths. 
but uh, essentially apples, crab apples, uh, uh, maples, uh, oaks, uh, birches, willows uh, are just a partial list, red buds are just a partial list of what uh, Fall Weber will get on. And if you live uh, essentially south of a line through Lincoln, Illinois, uh, just a little bit north of Springfield, Illinois, you'll get two generations of fall webworm a year. So you'll have a early summer, late spring webworm as well. Uh, and, uh, and north of that line, it's only one generation per year. Uh, generally, they don't cause any real serious damage to the tree. The tree will relief those areas. Uh, you can cut them out if you want. Um, if, you, if you spray for them in the BTK, the Bacillus thuringiensis kerstaki, so does Dipel or Thuricide, a bacterial toxin insecticide that has little effect on anything other than caterpillars will uh, will work but you need to make sure you get inside the silk tent and break it up to get to where the caterpillars are but many times uh, as you might guess from uh, from the infestation that's on one of my own trees it's been there for three weeks and I've just been watching it so uh, it's uh, it's really not going to cause any real serious damage to a tree and uh, and the tree survives it well and no, it's not going to spread to your arbor vitae. Okay, thank you very much. Diane, we're going to get to you in just a second. We're going to let Kay do her last show and tell with something I had never seen before. So <laughs> tell us a little bit so, about what you got. All right, this, this, this is a cucumber and it's called dragon's egg. And yeah. I have grown it before and um, I love it. It's a really good tasting cucumber. <clears throat> and the plants just produce and produce and produce and produce. I've got bags of these cucumbers everywhere <laughs> in my kitchen, um, but they're very, they're they very good to eat. I was just going to ask mm -hmm. what the flavor was like compared to your it's average one It's just a regular the cucumber, really? but they're kind of sweet and they they hold well on the vine. You know, they don't get uh, lose their flavor mm -hmm. like some cucumbers mm -hmm. do or get too big. <clears throat> and so I I really like these, and I use them for pickles, and mm -hmm. you know we eat them raw. And do they ever turn bitter when it's too dry? I grew um, a, I grew a light skinned one one summer, and it was horrible. Every no, time these, it got a little dry. So far, these have, have done really well. Good. Some of them well, will do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was they but were so bitter one. we couldn't even eat them. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. No. Th no. This one's tends to be. It, okay. I mean, it's been dry, and yeah. they've been really uh, really I'll flavorful. Hmm. So. You said a little on the sweet side. A little, just a little bit. That yeah. might be good in some water. I like cucumber oh, yeah. water. Oh yeah. yeah, they'd be great in yeah. cucumber water. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, now I'm officially interested. Dragon's egg. <laughs> Dragon's egg. Dragon's egg. Okay. Thanks so much. How long Kay. does it take to hatch? I don't know. I have. I've got some <laughs> two more than they have. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I... Diane from Westville. <laughs> Sorry, it took us so long, Diane. She has a question about that pesky creeping Charlie. Diane, uh -huh. are you there? Yes. Hi. Go Hi. ahead. Yes, I moved to this property about a year ago, and I've got Creeping Charlie throughout the whole entire yard. I'm trying to get rid of it. I don't know exactly how to do this. I do have a lot of trees and vegetation around, ornamental grasses, hostas. also have birds, rabbits, and squirrels, but then I want to start getting rid of it and then working on thickening up a good lush lawn. How do I do this? How, what will get rid of this? Who wants to tell her oh. the bad news? It sounds like you have an awful lot of shade, and that's why you have the <laughs> bumper crop of Creeping Charlie. I, I would kind of recommend that you learn to like it a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a really tough weed. It's one of the toughest weeds to control. And I, my dad ended up using a dethatching rake over an entire summer and raked it out by hand. Oh, and wow. that was after years of trying all sorts of things and combinations of things that I told him might not be safe, <laughs> but he didn't care. Dads are going to do Dads that. Dads do that. I, if anyone else has it, it's, it's different. Tough to, yeah, it's tough. You, I use it as a ground cover. <laughs> That's actually one of the reasons it was brought here. It was also yeah. a medicinal plant, and yeah. it is a member of the mint family, mm -hmm. so that's kind of like stacked against yeah, you, too. Yeah, because if, if you try to pull it, you have to get every All little of bit of root yeah. out, and that's impossible. To do. And yeah, I handle it by, by mowing root? high, <laughs> and uh, I have a mower set about as high as it'll go, and... 
and uh, where it's underneath the shade of, say, my apple trees, right down to the drip line, it's all creeping Car Charlie into the trunk, but it's shaded enough, doesn't grow real tall or doesn't do any bid. And if you catch a little bit, you get this beautiful odor in there the air. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and out where it gets out, where there's plenty of sun, uh, I'm, I'm blessed with very good soil, so it just grows up and and you can find creeping Charlie there, but you got to really hunt hard yeah. around around the grass. And uh, I lost my deadlines the same way; just mowed high, yeah. and they, they shaded out. So, uh, but if you've got a lot of a lot of trees in your yard, uh, uh, Jennifer's suggestion of uh, learn to love it because you probably won't be able to get rid of it is not a bad idea. Because if you do get rid of it, it you're going to have bare soil or or just spindly grass due to the shade, and it'll come back in. And believe me. Uh, shade beats hot sun with nice grass any day of the week, in my opinion. <laughs> is that one of the ones that it has a very, very deep root? Wasn't no, it's no, no, shallow. You grab shallow. a hole, it comes right up but easily. Can grow from that, any little bit. Yeah, that's okay. Like yeah. Get yeah. okay. I couldn't remember which one of the, the troublesome weeds has a very, very deep root. Oh, that's going to mm. bug me now. I'll have to go through mm -hmm. the archives. <laughs> 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 so uh, we've got about a minute or so left, 30 seconds left. Um, What's growing in your gardens while we're just wasting time? What are you guys growing? Well, cucumbers and tomatoes. Yeah. Cucumbers. Cucumbers. We know what kinds growing, tomatoes. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Zucchini. Waiting for my first, I'm waiting for my first red tomatoes. I'm jealous of Kay's <laughs> giant tomatoes. <laughs> nice. Nice, Phil. You got any? We've just finished having roasting ears or sweet corn oh, came oh, in, yeah. and we just finished that up. And I'm trying to decide where I'm going to pick my wrong tomatoes this week or next week. And... Uh, and the water lilies in our in our water gardens are just blooming beautifully. Nice. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the time we've got for tonight. Thank you so much for watching and calling. We will see you next week. Good night.